Well, good morning uh, from the West Coast here. We're coming to you live from the Hoover Institution, our studio here at the Hoover Institution on the main campus of Stanford University. Uh, my name is Karis Templeman. I am a research fellow here at the Hoover Institution. Uh, and I also manage the project on Taiwan in the Indo-Pacific region. Uh, and we have a bit of a special event today. We, we have both an in-person speaker and a remote speaker. Uh, so we're trying to pull off a hybrid event. Uh, so bear with us if the room and the, the atmospherics look a little different than usual. Um, <clears throat> the uh, event that we have planned for you today uh, is about Taiwan and the UN. Um, and uh, if uh, many people in our audience have probably noticed already, but um, there was a, a visit by the uh, UN High Commissioner for Human Rights, Michelle Bachelet, uh, to uh, the PRC this past week. Uh, and she gave a press conference that effectively whitewashed the PRC's uh, continuing repression in Xinjiang. Uh, that's one data point uh, of how the PRC has continued to expand its influence uh, within UN and UN related organizations. Um, but uh, if you were Taiwanese, you are much more familiar with this probably than most of uh, most non Taiwanese of, of this kind of uh, influence on uh, UN related organizations. Uh, Taiwan has been excluded from the World Health Assembly for the sixth year in a row uh, and the third consecutive year during the middle of a global pandemic. Uh, they, there are Taiwan reporters who have been excluded from even covering the WHA, while PRC reporters have gotten credentials to get in to cover it. Uh, and even Taiwanese passports are not considered valid uh, at many UN or UN-related organizations. Uh, and so Taiwanese cannot even enter the building uh, in, in many of these places. Um, so to talk about this issue today, uh, we have uh, two uh, two wonderful experts on this topic. Um, we have uh, first Jessica Drun, who is a non-resident fellow with the Atlantic Council's Global China Hub. She has also held positions in the defense contracting space and the National Bureau of Asian Research. Uh, and uh, I hope this doesn't embarrass you, Jessica, but you're also kind of a, a, a Twitter persona. Uh, a lot of people throw up the, the bat signal for Jessica whenever uh, somebody on Twitter gets the one China principle versus the one China policy wrong or somehow confuses the two. And uh, she's the, the go-to person to set people straight. Um, so we're delighted to have her join us today. Uh, we also in the studio, in person here, have Zhu Fu Ye, who is uh, a Taiwanese uh, by birth and uh, grew up in Taiwan. He's a PhD candidate here uh, studying microbial is that right? Microbial Community Ecology and Evolution in the Department of Biology. Uh, he uh, is here in part to talk about his experience as a graduate student, uh, just trying to do his training. In winter 2020, he applied to a UNESCO winter school session on quantitative systems biology. And because he's Taiwanese, he was denied permission to attend the event. Uh, and so uh, from the broad kind of uh, PRC pressure on UN agencies, we move down to individual cases that affect, uh, you know, in a in pretty negative way, Stanford students. Uh, and so uh, I want to talk both at the broad level and about the individual level today. Um, I uh, hope I don't steal Jessica's thunder here by uh, just introducing the topic a little bit uh, and noting that one of the reasons there's uh, a, a great deal of um, trouble for Taiwanese with UN agencies is that there's a campaign underway by the People's Republic of China to reinterpret United Nations Resolution 2758, which is the resolution that brought the People's Republic of China into the United Nations and booted the Republic of China on Taiwan out of the United Nations. Um, there is a fallacy that uh, Resolution 2758 is the same as or consistent with the People's Republic of China's One China Principle. Uh, and in fact, uh, there's no mention of Taiwan or of the Republic of China in that, uh, in that resolution. Uh, in fact, the resolution, as, uh, as Jessica is gonna discuss today, uh, made so not, no such determination about Taiwan's status or about, um, the uh, future trajectory of, of cross-strait relations. Um, 
And this, is in, this intent is reflected in the historical record and the meeting minutes, as well as in the resolutions raised at the time for the General Assembly's consideration. Um, there is also a broader effort by the PRC to expand its influence in and impose its own priorities on UN affiliated bodies, including the World Health Assembly, the International Civil Aviation Organization, and even UNESCO, as we'll hear about later today. Um, Beijing has institutionalized and normalized its own stance within these international bodies by signing secret agreements, uh, including uh, agreements, MOUs, that restrict Taiwan's access to the UN and its facilities. And uh, they have embedded PRC nationals across various levels of UN staff. Uh, the UN and its specialized agencies have not generally made the text of these agreements public. Uh, and uh, as Jessica will talk about today, we can glean some insights into what they say through leaks, through leaked memorandums. Um, so uh, without further ado, I'm gonna turn the floor over to Jessica, who will uh, actually, there's one other thing I need to plug, uh, which is uh, Jessica is also the co-author of a wonderful report published by the German Marshall Fund on this very issue, on the PRC's presence and expanding influence at the UN. Um, and I encourage uh, members of our audience to check that out. It's co-authored with Bonnie Glazer of the German Marshall Fund, uh, and it's, uh, I believe the title is The Use and Abuse of UN Resolution 2758. Uh, and so uh, if you're interested in what Jessica has to say today, I encourage you to check out the report where there's a lot more details. Okay, with that, I will turn it over to Jessica. It's good to see you. Thank you. Um, it's great to be here today. So as Kars mentioned, the PRC has attempted to reframe the narrative around UN Resolution 2758 as having come to a UN level determination on Taiwan's status. At the same time, it has also pursued a creeping narrative that its one China principle has been substantiated by UN Resolution 2758 and is thus an international norm. For context, Beijing's one China principle is more or less its claim that there's only one China in the, in the world, Taiwan is a part of that China, and the People's Republic of China is the sole legal government, government representing the whole of that China. So in my remarks today, I'm going to walk through what the original intent of UN Resolution 2758 was, how the PRC has shifted that narrative, and then conclude with what that means for Taiwan and global governance more broadly. So for our report with the German Marshall Fund, we look through the official original documents, meeting minutes, and records to determine what the original intent of UN Resolution 2758 was when it was, voting, when it was being voted on in 1971. These documents indicate that the only question resolved through the resolution was that the PRC would hold the China seat at the UN. So as Karis mentioned, the official text of the foundational document that is UN Resolution 2758 does not mention Taiwan or the Republic of China, only the representatives of Chiang Kai-shek. Second, the draft resolution amendment, amendments that were being considered show that the member states did offer to address questions of how the UN would handle the ROC and or Taiwan. However, these draft resolutions and amendments were not raised, meaning that these questions were not considered on the UN floor and thus were essentially tabled. These draft resolutions and amendments included one that would allow for the represent representation of the ROC alongside the PRC, ones that raised the question of representation of the people on Taiwan, and one that would clarify the territory of the PRC to only include the territory over which it had jurisdiction. So again, this shows that the only question considered was who would hold the China seat at the UN. And this is further substantiated by remarks from states that voted in support of the Albanian resolution, which is what would become UN Resolution 2758, and by statements from PRC officials at the time. For example, the Malaysian representative at the time said, quote, we view the question of Taiwan as a separate issue, end quote. T the Tunisian re uh, representative said, quote, this should not prejudge the future interests of Formosa, which in conformity with the principles of the charter concerning the rights of people to self-determination may wish to be represented in the United Nations as an entity separated from China. And again, both of these countries voted ultimately in support of UN Resolution 2758. Um, further, a recorded conversation between Henry Kissinger and Zhou Enlai showed that Beijing was worried that the Albanian resolution was insufficient ahead of the vote, they said that it did not include a clause explicitly mentioning Taiwan and quote, if it is passed, the status of Taiwan is yet, not yet decided. So how has this narrative shifted and how has the PRC been moving the goalpost? 
So gradually, over the past five decades, the PRC has shifted the narrative in how its state media mentions the One China Principle in the context of UN Resolution 2758. In the early years, it did not mention one in the context of the others. But from the late 1990s and early 2000s, it began to men mention the two within the same sentence as UN Resolution 2758 and the One China Principle. So as separate, but suggesting that they embodied the same concepts. Finally, since the Thai administration, state media has begun framing the One China Principle as embedded in UN Resolution 2758, using language such as the One China Principle was quote, incorporated by, confirmed by, adopted by, or affirmed by the resolution. Simultaneously, the PRC has worked to embed its stance on, the, on Taiwan at the UN, including by barring Taiwanese passport holders from entering UN facilities and interning, attending UN functions by signing MOUs with UN specialized agencies, such as the WHO, that requires UN coordination on Taiwan to be channeled through PRC government agencies, to even barring the participation of civil society for not using, quote, correct nomenclature on Taiwan on their websites and materials. There seems to have been relative success in shifting UN level guidance and understanding towards Taiwan. In 2000, there was the first public mention of a UN One China policy, which was vague and unspecified, but mentioned in a comment from Kofi Annan. In 2008, Ban Ki-moon said that Taiwan is a part of the PRC, but was met with pushback from the United States and, an, and its allies, with the UN Office of Legal Affairs saying that it would, quote, no longer use that unhelpful phrase. The U.S. has also pushed back against the U.N. before in a 2007 non-paper, stressing that the view that Taiwan is part of the PRC is not universally held by all U.N. member states, um, which each has, with, with each member state having its own, quote, one, it, its own one China policy, many of which are similar to Washington's, which holds that Taiwan's status is not yet determined. In more recent years, however, there has been a marked shift in U.N. guidance on Taiwan, which has more or less reiterated the PRC position on Taiwan, though the US and its allies has continued to push back. So what are the implications of this? Um, there are many, many of uh, which extend beyond just Taiwan. Taiwan's exclusion is just one example of how the PRC has been able to use the UN to advance party state goals, which again, is not limited to just Taiwan, but also to its Belt and Road Initiative, its divergent views on the international order, particularly as it pertains to human rights and rule of law, among many others. Finally, PRC pressure on the UN system and its efforts to exclude Taiwan also create a gaping hole in global coordination on transnational issues, such as in global aviation safety, and we've seen in and as we've seen in the COVID-19 pandemic response. Barring Taiwanese experts and specialists, such as my co-panelists here from UN events, also leads to a knowledge gap in information sharing and more complete discussions and debates on topics beneficial to the global community. Thank you. So that's the general picture. Um, we'll now turn to uh, our esteemed colleague and student, um, Jeff Fouillet, to speak about his own personal experience uh, as a student at Stanford University trying to uh, get a degree. <laughs> uh, thank you, Paris, for a very nice introduction and for giving me the opportunity to share my personal experience as a victim of the abuse of these uh, specific resolutions. So, uh, uh, when I was invited to this talk, I was thinking about like what kind of audience would be interested in these very specific panels. I can think of like two categories of people. So one is like Taiwanese that are actually interested in Taiwanese politics. And the second is like American that are interested in Taiwan politics. And today I hope through my experience, I want to share some like message that might relevant to these two group of people. So I'll start with my story. Uh, so two years ago uh, in winter 2020, uh, which is a very uh, horrible winter, I think, uh, I applied to this like online uh, winter school in ICTP, which is a short for International Center for Theoretical Physics. And it's an organization affiliated with uh, UNESCO. And a week later, I got an email from them saying that, oh, we have to reject you because of your Taiwanese nationality. And they're referring, they're referring to this UN rules, which they didn't specify which UN rules that mm -hmm. apply. And so re they rejected me. And because I was like a biology PhD student, I, didn't, I wasn't really familiar with 
what happened there. So I was really confused. So I just screenshot the email and write a tweet about it. And surprisingly, that tweet got some attention and was circling around like academia circle. And because of that, the president of the ICTP contacted me to what wishing to explain what really happened to this UN rules that they're referring to. So what I learned from the conversation with them is that uh, these UN rules are indeed the resolution uh, 2758. And, and, but it was a recent change of interpretation of this UN resolution because before uh, 2019, Taiwanese were able to attend uh, ICTP or UNESCO affiliated event. But it was until recently that uh, potentially because of uh, the US government leave the UNESCO, making China become the major founder of the UNESCO that they put more stricter interpretation of these UN recent resolutions so that they started to exclude Taiwanese from participating. And in the meantime, uh, my tweet got a little bit more attention and it goes to like Taiwanese local media. And at the same time, Teco started to contact me and a lot of different international medias asked me for uh, writing an article about it. And and I think it's because of the pressure from both Teco and the international media that the US government also started to have some actions. They released a, a public statement from the House of Foreign Affairs specifically, specifically addressed this particular issue. And I think it's a little bit of uh, pressure from these international media, uh, Taiwanese government and US governments that the UNESCO has to respond to this specific incidents happened to this uh, tiny winter school. And so like their response was that they decided to reverse these decisions and saying that this uh, UN rule, this is an overly strict interpretation of the relevant UN res resolutions. Although like nothing really being codified that nothing really changed because of this, but uh, I think it's still an important message that like from individual action that can lead to uh, a change of a global institution such as UNESCO to change their interpretation of uh, these UN resolutions. So from that, I have some message for this two category of audience that I was thinking. So I guess from like Taiwanese perspectives, uh, if you're growing up from Taiwan, you were always or like familiar with this kind of exclusion that happened all the time, either to athletes or to like government officials. Like they get excluded from like international sport event or different kind of global assembly. And when one really accounted, encounters such event, it's very easily to get overwhelmed by the complication of the geopolitics and history behind all this. And I think uh, like uh, as the US-China relationship getting more and more complicated, such incidents would likely to be happen more and more often. And I think for the individual who actually encountered this, uh, instead of thinking that uh, your action wouldn't really help to make any change, uh, I think it's important to think that um, like indiv individual action matters. And from my experience, just from a simple tweet from a PhD student who studied biology can lead to the, the change of interpretation of resolution by UNESCO. I think it's an important message that individual, individual action matters and you can really change, drive critical change of the whole systems. And the second I want to say about is to like Americans who care about Taiwanese politics is that um, because the intrinsic 
ambiguity or the ambiguity that PRC, the narrative PRC tried to frame it, that this uh, resolution is really a dynamical process between interplay between US, China, and Taiwan. And these different policies really have the real consequences for the people in Taiwan. And, and also when people trying to say, talk about this US-China relationship, people oftentimes use this like great power politics kind of framing narratives treating Taiwan as like a bargaining chips on the table that treating it kind of like an object, but at the same time, it's a democratic country with 23 million people living on that. Uh, I think it's also important to think about the agency of like Taiwanese government and uh, like determination of Taiwanese people. As we learned from the past few months about the Ukrainian war, that this really matters uh, to determine the directionality of how work uh, is gonna evolve. And so in addition, I think this consideration is also aligned with Americans' interest because whatever uh, policy or when such event happen, uh, what Americans do really matters and to like Taiwanese people's emotions and really affect like election outcomes in the futures. And so I think it's important to take this layer of thinking when think about Taiwanese, Taiwan geopolitical issues. And yeah, and I think that's all I want to say about. Okay, okay. wonderful. Well done. We'll grill you about your research uh, here in a little bit, but yeah. uh, that was that was great. Um, I, for the first round of questions here, I'll take a stab at a couple, uh, and I invite our audience online. Um, most of you probably know this already, in, now that we're in the Zoom world, uh, but there is a Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. If you'd like to pose a question to either of our speakers, uh, just type it in there, and I'll see it on my laptop here. Um, and uh, we'll, have, uh, we'll have about 45 minutes uh, for uh, a kind of open Q&A uh, and discussion here. Um, for uh, the first question, uh, I wanted to ask Jessica if you could clarify for us the difference between China's one China principle and the United States one China policy. Is there a difference? And if so, what is it? Sure. Um, so there is a difference. Um, as I said in my remarks, uh, Beijing's one China principle is essentially its view um, that Taiwan is a part of the PRC. The US one China policy um, is essentially the US position on Taiwan as grounded in the Taiwan Relations Act, the three joint communiques and the six assurances. And um, the, it is that the official US position on Taiwan is that Taiwan's status is not determined. And this gets a little confusing because if you look at the official language of the joint communiques, it says the US acknowledges the Chinese view. And there's layers of ambiguity there. Acknowledge, and you know, oftentimes people will scream at me about this on Twitter because they just look it up in the dictionary. But acknowledge in diplomatic terms means simply to take note of. It does not mean that the US agrees with what the, what the PRC view is. And I think at that point in time, the deliberate use of the word Chinese over PRC or China is also significant because at that point in time in the 70s, you had both the ROC and their PRC with claims to Taiwan. So the Chinese is another added layer of ambiguity there. Um, it, to follow up on that, are there ways that the US could make our own position and the, and the differences between American policy and the PRC's approach clearer? Or, or do you have specific recommendations for things which we should emphasize or pay attention to? Yeah, um, I think, you know, starting with the, I think halfway through the Trump administration, we began to see a lot more clarification and pushback against PRC efforts to complete their one China principle with our one China policy. I think, you know, just adding in the possession, possessive that it's ours um, adds an element that it's different and that it's our own. 
Um, I think also, you know, we've seen a lot of U.S. government statements now clarify the U.S. has never subscribed to the PRC One China principle. And I think that's important as well. Um, I would only add to that that I think we need to see this from our allies as well. Um, a clarification of what their unique One China policies are and push back against the PRC efforts to paint them as one and the same with the PRC's One China principle. That's great. Very helpful, thanks. Um, I wanted to follow up on uh, an observation that you and Bonnie made in the report that you did, uh, which is that um, I, I was struck by how recent a lot of the changes are at the UN. This is not uh, something that dates back to 1971, but it's really a 21st century phenomenon. And even within the last 15 years, a lot of these shifts have occurred. Uh, and so what happened at the UN to uh, enable these shifts? Um, do you have a sense of the political processes that went into signing secret memorandums? Um, and why wasn't the U.S. or partners and allies involved in pushing back against these? So I think a lot of it comes from more of the cross-strait dynamics at play. I think if you look at the early 90s when China first started um, its efforts to restrain or, or constrain Taiwan at the U.N., was when Taiwan first democratized because it added a new variable to cross road relations when before it was just the KMT and the CCP. Um, with the addition of the Taiwanese electorate and um, voices and unique Taiwanese voices with um, impact on government and impact on you know, what the Taiwanese government would do at the international level that instilled, I guess, fear for lack of a better word in the PRC that there would be a push towards independence. Um, in whatever you know conceptualization they view it as um, within the UN system, because because if you look at um, statements from Li Donghui, a lot of calls for Taiwan's or Taiwan to be further represented in the UN came from the Taiwanese people. Um, and then onwards, you know, if you look at when the DPP is in power, you also see more aggressive public action from the PRC towards Taiwan at the UN and the UN level. And um, if you look at our report and one of the pages, we have a handy timeline to kind of show how the narrative has shifted, depending how, how much the narrative has shifted, depending on which party is in power in Taiwan. Um, notably, um, if you look at the period of rapprochement with the KMT from two, 2008 to 2016, the PRC did not mention the One China Principle or UN Resolution 2758 at all, because in their view, the 1992 consensus was sufficient and they wanted to extend an olive branch to the KMT. Um, but with the DPP's unwillingness to acknowledge the 1992 consensus, um, it was, th there was one example I think that sticks out in my mind as how impactful domestic, or how impactful cross relations are and how China um, puts pressure on Taiwan at the UN. Um, this example is in 2016 was Taiwan's last formal invite to the WHA. Um, that was because Tai was inaug inaugurated in May, which is around the same time that the invites go out. Um, I think China was still holding out that Tai would agree to the 1992 consensus. And so Taiwan's letter was delayed that year and in the letter, it was the first time out of all of Taiwan's invites um, over the past few years that explicitly mentioned the One China Principle. And so Tsai's unwillingness to agree to a One China, um, not, not that the onus is on the Tsai administration, but it is showing that that is, that is what, in China's view, um, should be the baseline for Taiwan's participation. I want to follow up on that and ask, uh, this is actually a pretty, uh, pretty dramatic shifting of UN positions in response to the concerns of one of the member nations of the UN. Uh, in your research, did you find any other country that has been able to exercise such influence over policies or principles in the same way that the PRC has in recent years? Um, or is this, to your mind, just completely different from anything that's come before the UN? I don't know if I have a solid answer because I sometimes find my, my research a bit niche, um, yeah. but in my understanding, um, this is a rather unique example. I think I, I would perhaps point to 
Israel, Palestine, but I know, you know, there's the Arab League that helps counteract in terms of numbers, um, efforts to restrict Palest Palestinian representative at the U representation at the UN. And I will say on that point, you know, China has been very successful in ensuring that it has a sufficient number of UN member states to back up its views um, at the UN level, which is all the more striking when you look at the original documents where you have you know, post-colonial states calling for the importance of um, self-determination and representation of the Taiwanese people. Um, and I think part of that is China has been very successful in weaving this anti-colonial narrative um, of, of the PRC being anti-colonial as well. But there's an irony in that too, in when, you know, the PRC cannot get smaller states um, to back its stance, then it applies economic pressure on these countries. Um, I think one of the examples that we found was that if a, um, if a diplomat from an African country is unwilling to align with China in its votes or in its statements towards Taiwan, especially, um, these diplomats find that they get phone calls back from their home government saying that, you know, economic packages are, you know, are being threatened or to be revoked. I don't want to dominate the conversation here. So uh, we've got uh, a great group in the room, uh, representatives from the student body at Stanford. I want to turn it over to our, our students in the room. Do you have questions for either of our speakers that you would like to pose? Yeah. Kevia? I can ask a, a perhaps a simple question. Um, I know that the, this resolution came a number of years before the US, for example, switched its diplomatic recognition from the PRC to the ROC. So I'm wondering if the language of this resolution has been replicated in other countries, like bilateral statements about Taiwan, or if there are implications beyond the UN in terms of its language. Um, so that's not something I've looked at in depth, but from my understanding, the UN language is more vague because it is a, um, from my understanding of how one China policies work, um, some International organizations all have their own one China policy, whether explicitly defined or not, um, or even you know explicitly called that. But because of the nature of international organizations requiring consensus or you know lowest common denominator among member states, they generally tend to be more ambiguous than countries' own one China policies. So, my, my understanding of your story is after, after you sent your tweet, it, it garnered all that attention. Essentially, the um... Uh, the physics lab reversed their decision and allowed you to participate. Is that, is that correct? Uh, so, like by the end, uh, they decide to reverse the decision. Like the the winter school I applied to already ends. Okay. But what they did was like they have like another similar kind of conference. They invited me to attend. Okay. To demonstrate that like Taiwanese are able to attend such event in the future, but limited to like virtual events. So they're not certain about whether. Uh, in person event it's also possible because of the visa okay so that kind of gets to my question then is did you see was it did that you know change in interpretation extend to other taiwanese citizens or was it were you kind of the exception of the rule and then they reversed course right back to the original interpretation they were holding yeah i was told that it was applied to all of the taiwanese okay. citizens but uh i haven't been follow up that whether like other taiwanese apply and they got rejected. I have heard from anyone. Okay. So I think it's uh, for the older virtual event, it's they're gonna accept Taiwanese, but now what I was trying to do is to apply that the physical like in-person event and see whether same things would happen. Yeah. So it's still an open question then whether you could attend a UN backed event in person. Yes. Precisely because of the visa issue, it mm -hmm. sounds like. Yes. But like, like now their advertisement of the event, now they put that they accept all the nationality specifically on the advertisement. Okay. So <laughs> maybe there's well, something. You've made a difference then. That's, a, <laughs> that's one small victory in a larger, larger struggle, it sounds like. Um, um, uh, other questions, yeah. Yeah, another question for Chifu. So, uh, just to piggyback on that, you said there's a lot of attention garnered and you said, I think even the House or uh, congressmen were involved in kind of pushing this. 
Um, just what was your uh, reaction or how did they advance your position um, in that regard? Uh, I think to that point, it was already like out of my hand that I don't really have any decision on what the thing is going to roll out. So I was like very surprised that the, the argument, like the, the statement uh, published and, and at the same time, I was like interviewed by several uh, international media. I think one of them is like Telegraph and she was asking me about my view on this statement and and how and and I think they also used that view to push to ask UNESCO and ICTP about whether they how they interpret this like statement from the US government and and like their response was yeah it's our over strict interpretation and and from that part, I don't think I have a lot of involvement or I can do anything. Oh, I did in the end, I, I did a publish state, public statement on the whole event, uh, requesting uh, what I would think need to be done, asking UNESCO to do like three things to like codify like the protection of like Taiwanese, Taiwanese scientists, uh, but they didn't like respond to any of my required like my request. So that's what happened. Yeah. Uh, Jessica, can I ask you a, a follow up related to this? But um, given your research on this question, do you think it's actually possible to get some of the the secret or private MOUs and the, the kind of legal guidance and all of that related to Taiwan access to UN organizations to get that? made public? That seems like a pretty small ask in the larger scheme of things. Um, but transparency is sometimes a hard thing for these organizations. So what are your thoughts on that? Sure. And I apologize for the background noise. I think there's a motorcade. Just okay. Driving by. <laughs> um, so from my understanding, the U.S. government could request um, that all MOUs at the U.N. level be publicized. But I think that would include the ones that the U.S. has signed. And I have no insight into what the U.S. Gov State Department, U.S. government has signed or with the U.N. Um, in terms of MOUs. Um, I think, you know, fundamentally though, the element of transparency at the U.N. is an important one. I think this is something that Congress would be interested in. That said, um, the existence of the MOUs that we've mentioned previously, including the WHO one, the only reason we know about those is because um, they have been leaked. And to be clear, it's not the full text of the MOU that has been leaked. There has been an implementation memo that was leaked, I think in the early 2000s. And then there was a guidance memo that was implemented or that was released not too soon after that. From my understanding though, it this the MOU process seems to be one of the ways through which China um, is able to enact influence at the UN. Um, I've talked to former government officials from their understanding, China has MOUs with a number of UN agencies that don't, not just on Taiwan, right? So they have a number of BRI ones um, with UN agencies across the board. And so it wouldn't be beyond belief, right, to say that there is the possibility that there is a number of MOUs between the PRC and UN specialized agencies as it relates to Taiwan and to the targeted specialized agencies that the Taiwan government has been trying to join. So, you know, perhaps ICAO, perhaps um, the, um, I'm blanking on Interpol. Um, so, you know, I think this is something worth digging into, um, but the lack of transparency regarding the MOUs and regarding the broader UN system as well, to me, is a bit concerning. That's really helpful. I did not know a lot of that. Um, I want to turn now to uh, some of our online, uh, so our online audience's questions. Um, and uh, the, the first is from... Um, uh, Michael Fonte, who's the director of the DPP's mission in Washington, D.C., who you probably know. Um, 
he asks, he notes that uh, in the final section of your report with uh, Bonnie Glazer, uh, you show how the PRC has actually changed documents uh, to substitute Taiwan province of China for Taiwan. Uh, and uh, he asks, have, has there been any attempt by the U.S. government or other, other actors to try to correct these documents and get the originals from 1971 back in place? Yeah, um, I, I guess for context for everyone else um, that might not have read the report yet, um, we found that there have been changes made to historic UN documents. Um, the one example, the two examples that we found were with the International Telecommunication Union, which is a UN specialized agency, in which the original text of the document simply said Taiwan. And at some point in time, a newer version of the document has been changed to Taiwan, comma, province of China. Um, so this was found, we had found two examples. One was in a document on disaster relief and the other was on um, information and communications technologies. And these are the only public examples that we can find. And um, like I said, a lot of UN documents and websites are kind of a black hole. So it would not surprise me if there are more examples um, that you know the people are unaware of. Um, I'm not sure if there's anything being actively done by the US government or at least publicly done. I think one of the um, hopes of this report was that it would generate um, a response from the US government and from you know, NGOs and from Congress um, to take action on this and to be aware that this is happening. I think one point that we make in the report is that no issue regarding Taiwan at the UN is too small for China to push back on. I mean, one of the examples that we cite is there was a um, you know, civil society trying to join um, NGO discussions on something as innocuous as like, I think the organization that we mentioned was a global bicycle organization. They had somehow incorrectly mentioned Taiwan on their website and China tried to block their access at the UN saying you've incorrectly referenced Taiwan, even though, you know, like a global bicycle organization probably has little vested in cross-strait relations. And I think that just goes to show that like, you know, because no issue is too small for organizations such as this bicycle organization, such as a random high school in the Midwest, right? It is more important for them to gain you an access than to push back against the PRC for Taiwan. They might not even fully understand the issue. And I think this is why it's important that, you know, policy circles, governments are aware that this is going on so that they can back these NGOs and civil society um, to make sure that they're not being forced to self-censor or reframe how they mention Taiwan on their website just so that they can gain critical UN access. Yes. I just have a quick question for you, Jessica. Um, my name's Hannah. I'm an undergrad here at Stanford. I was just curious, so assuming that the PRC's endgame is ultimately to change the way the international community conceptualizes Taiwan's status, um, do you think that they'll actually be able to accomplish this shift through this narrative kind of gradual approach? Um, and then at the same time, what do you think it would take to reverse this trajectory? So I think to your first point, there's a mutual re mutually reinforcing element here, right? So they're essentially saying that because UN Resolution 2758, in their view, uh, embeds the One China Principle, that one, the One China Principle is international law because um, UN member states voted on it in 1971. And so with this, they're able to force, try to force countries, including ones that you know, they may be forming diplomatic relations with, that they might be signing new communiques with, that because the UN has substantiated this, then the country's one China policy, if, you know, if they have not fully formulated one with some of the diplomatic allies they're trying to push with Taiwan, should more or less align with global, global views as they perceive it. Um, in terms of pushback, I'm, I think from, what, from my understanding, the Office of Legal Affairs um, determinations are non-binding. And the issue that we're running into right now is the implementation of the legal assessments, not the legal assessments itself. Um, I think, you know, the U.S. hasn't done much to push back publicly. Um, even the non-letter from 2007 that wasn't made public, it was, from what I understood, was leaked. 
Um, I think more should be done publicly and privately and in coordination with US allies and partners. Um, and I think, I, I do feel like, you know, with the pandemic, there is perhaps a greater window to be able to effectively push back on that just because um, of how Beijing mishandled the COVID-19 response. But in, beyond that, the UN system is very complex and difficult to understand. So I'm not sure beyond that what can be done. Uh, another question from our online audience. Um, one of our observers notes that uh, the president of the United States, Joe Biden, uh, was recently in Asia, uh, made some comments that stirred up uh, a great deal of controversy and confusion about his willingness to defend Taiwan. Is the U.S.'s policy, the so-called policy of strategic ambiguity, related to any of this at all? Or is that a different issue entirely in your view? I, I would say I think it's a separate issue, the defense of Taiwan versus um, Taiwan's international space. I think there's overlap in you know, what it means for um, Taiwan on the world stage, but I don't think you can draw a direct connection between the two. Okay, great. I, I'd agree with you. <laughs> um, so, um, I, another of our online uh, members asks, uh, was it a mistake in the beginning, in your view, uh, to, um, to be deferential to China when they were weak to play along with their veto of supporting Taiwan as an independent state? Would the PRC have stayed out of the WT and rejected US trade? Or would the PRC have stayed out of, in fact, let me make this question broader, if we're playing what ifs, uh, given your work on uh, the 1971 switch in, in seat, do you think there was a two China solution that uh, could have been worked out that, that uh, the Chiang Kai-shek regime on Taiwan actually missed an opportunity to stay in the UN and just move in out of the Security Council seat, but into uh, just a general uh, UN assembly seat? I, I do think there was a missed opportunity there, but you know, it, 50 years ago, right? Right. Lack of, what is it? Hindsight's always 2020. Um, but I will say, you know, I think what the trends that we're seeing in the UN with the PRC pushing that narrative um, points to the broader, Be Beijing's broader MO to rewrite history when they're in a position of power, right? So they didn't push back. They didn't even release statements conflating the one China principle with UN resolution 2758 in the 1970s. Like I, I looked through, um, like uh, archives of Xinhua, of People's Daily, they did not mention the two together at all. And now they're saying that, you know, the One China Principle has long been a global international norm since the 70s. Um, everyone has always agreed to it. Um, you know, the UN made a UN level determination on Taiwan in 1971. And that's false. And it shows that, you know, when they're in a position of weakness, they won't say anything. But now that they're stronger in relative terms, they're willing to push back um, and rewrite history. And I think that's telling of its MO across the board on a lot of other issues, right? Um, including the South China Sea, including um, US policy towards Taiwan. And I think what's most jarring, or at least to me personally, what I found the most jarring um, in my research for this report was that I think in February of this year, Wang Yi said that because UN Resolution 2758 substantiated the One China Principle, it invalidates the US-Taiwan Relations Act. It invalidates the US six insurances. And, you know, just for them to be able to say that something that is untrue invalidates US law, the Taiwan Relations Act is US law. And therefore, you know, we have no ground to stand on, I think is, is just, mind blowing to me that they would push that far on that. And I think it's important, this is why it's important for countries and allies and partners to push back against this narrative, especially if they're trying to rewrite history in their favor. Um, do you see opportunities uh, over the next few years as there's growing wariness of, of Chinese influence, of PRC influence, I should say, within you know, the UN and related bodies uh, growing wariness from other countries, and there might be opportunities to build a coalition to push back more forcefully against these sorts of practices. Um, 
I think so. I would say, I think a few things need to be done or to be better understood. Um, I know, you know, when Taiwan has been trying to join the WHA in the past few years, a lot of what we've been hearing is that it is a member state issue. Taiwan's observership is a member state issue. But as I, you know, try to think through what that means, I'd never understood if it was fundamentally a member state issue or is it a member state issue because of opposition from one member state? And so the processes of participation and observership um, for Taiwan at different specialized agencies varies. Each one has its own process and some of these aren't public. So being able to understand how that works, I think will help provide viable channels for um, like-minded, like-minded countries to pursue a strategy of. Um, like for example, when I worked on I guess this paper's predecessor when I was an intern at CSIS in 2013, uh, we were able to find the uh, International Civil Aviation Organization's um, bylaws where they explicitly mentioned paths to observership. And I think, you know, if more specialized agencies um, publicize this information or if they were, be- they were, or if, you know, governments had access to them, being able to coordinate on this would be important. Other questions from our in-person audience in here? Um, do the two of you have thoughts that you would like to share with each other? Um, do you have any remarks on Jifu's experience? Is his exceptional or is it, uh, is, are we gonna see more like this, uh, more situations like his in the future? Um, so it was very interesting to hear about his experience and, you know, um, as we were doing the research for this, it was unclear when this process was implemented. Um, like I said, the UN, I will keep saying this here, the UN is a black hole and we could not pinpoint a date for when this process was implemented. Um, someone said as soon, you know, as early as 2009, which is a fascinating point in time because that was the start of the mom administration, right? So you kind of see that like stuff might've been going on behind the scenes, even when cross strait relations were at a high point. Um, there was something else that said it wasn't implemented until 2014, was it 2014? when the sunflower uh, movement started. Um, but I do think, you know, China will c- continuing pressure, pressuring Taiwan and uh, Taiwanese people as the Thai administration continues into the its last two years. Um, like I said, it's very much hinged on cross strait relations. Um, but it also seems that implementation of this is very ad hoc. It seems that it might come to the discretion of the UN office building. Um, we looked into a bit on like what documents are permitted. Um, sometimes Taiwanese passports, you know, if you have an additional form of documentation with it are fine. Sometimes you have to have a Thai Baldson, which what is, I don't, I can't remember the English for that. A, um, a, is a it Taiwan a, visitor's visa, yeah. Um, <laughs> um, so it's a it's a mainland issued uh, permit to travel to Taiwan, right? Yeah, right. So it's very unclear, and I think you know that also just points to how many issues Taiwanese people face in trying to just participate and contribute to global discussions that affect you know each and every one of us. Um, so yeah, not not great. Yeah, a uh, question for either one of you, courses of action for the, for the future um, and the, how this could play out, right? Um, you know, maybe, Chief, maybe your story um, encourages other Taiwanese to apply more, right? So maybe, you know, possibly a, a flood of Taiwanese students trying to uh, enter webinars, seminars, education events. Um, you know, how does that change uh, China's position? Do they become a little bit more aggressive or, like, you know, like always, does it discourage Taiwanese because um, because of your experience and maybe too much of a spotlight um, can discourage them. Um, just wonder you guys' thoughts on how that could play out. Yeah, I think one interesting thing that I observed during these things happen was like, I never, so it's always dealing with like either uh, the UNESCO side or like, like the international media. I never heard anything from like China side, so like even yeah, it's that's kind of weird to me that there like remain silent throughout the time, and 
And for me, I think uh, because as Jessica said, there are so many holes there that we don't know what's gonna happen. And I think like one thing that I can learn from my experience is that you just need to keep trying and sometimes you're like fall into different rabbit hole. And I think those rabbit hole would be a good example of what these roles that are hidden inside the UNs are. And yeah, and what? What's the question? Yeah, I mean, maybe you received other um, positive reinforcement from other Taiwanese oh, students, yeah. or um, what was the reaction? Yeah, so it was, I think one, this is like, like the effort of a lot of like Taiwanese students and uh, effort from like, also the support from like Stanford community that uh, from like faculties here and Kari's and everyone was like helping to uh, in this whole processes of uh, fighting against. So it's very supporting. And I think because the news was all over the Taiwanese media, there's a lot of support from like different uh, Taiwanese people. So I think people were like really care about such issues and want to like uh, try to make a change. Current status quo. Okay. Uh, Jessica, do you want to add anything to that? Yeah, um, I would just say that, you know, fundamentally, I think Taiwanese people being able to participate in these conversations is important. And, you know, despite, you know, all the roadblocks that they're reaching, I think there is a there is an element where they're actually, they're contributing substantively to these discussions. And I think the global community does appreciate this. And, you know, if we were to kind of take it up a level and look at the global pandemic response, you know, Taiwan gained a lot of support because Taiwan and Taiwanese scholars and specialists were doing so much um, with COVID-19 and, you know, sh doing information sharing with countries either bilaterally or, you know, through the channels that they were allowed. And I think, you know, if we keep doing, if Taiwanese students and scholars keep contributing, I think, you know, I think they will gradually shift the conversation and like, it will gradually um, gain more support um, through either, either UN member states or um, through civil society. And they, they these, um, these are all critical voices within the UN system. We've got time for just one more question. Yeah. Um, hi, Jessica. Hello, I'm Maya. I'm an undergrad student here. I guess my question is kind of just generally on the new literature that's kind of evolving right now on China's growing kind of power and influence within the UN. My question kind of is how much is this a China Taiwan issue in terms of, of course, having Taiwanese civil society speak up, students speak up, academics and people who are passionate on this issue, on this issue talking, and how much is this an issue of us kind of like examining the UN and kind of China's use of MOUs as well as agent uh, leadership over UN agencies, forgiveness of debts, um, et cetera, as kind of just generally having more of a kind of encroaching power on the UN. Like, yes, on one hand, speaking up is important, but will anything really change if we don't really examine kind of general standards and uh, values? I guess, within the UN. Yeah, and if I could piggyback on that, your report had some great uh, kind of actionables or recommendations, and I wondered if you might want to touch on those in the last couple of minutes. What, what can we do in a broader uh, sense to push back and to, to, improve, um, to improve the transparency and the uh, procedural legitimacy of international organizations? Sure. Um, so I think I would say, you know, Taiwan is always a useful case study for just China's broader toolkit, right, and how it um, conducts itself in the international arena, be it, you know, at the UN, or um, as it pressures countries, right, like a lot of what we're seeing with Eastern Europe was stuff that were, was were things that China was doing in Taiwan, perhaps five to six years ago. Um, so it's a good way to kind of tell, you know, what avenues they're going to pursue um, to try to gain greater influence or to pressure um, entities at the UN. Um, I will say, I think this is overall, though, a broader UN issue. Um, and I think that points to greater coordination with US allies and partners on not 
even just funding at the UN, but greater presence, right? I think in the past few years, um, in some of our capitals, there has been a distrust towards uh, international institutions um, and, you know, efforts by some elements um, of our political system that we should vacate our positions within these systems. And I think that is fundamentally the wrong approach. Um, part of the reason we've been able to see so much Chinese influence and you know, success in pushing the Chinese narrative within the UN is because they've been able to staff up, right? As Karis mentioned in his introductory remarks, um, I think there's a disproportionate amount of PRC um, staff members within at the UN. And, you know, it's been quoted by, I think, one of the senior staff members that, at least in the PRC, at least for him, but could be speaking for, you know, broader PRC nationals, that the interest of the PRC state comes first, comes before the UN. And, you know, this is in conflict with, I guess, the fundamental essence of what the UN should stand for, where it's, um, you know, civil servants are supposed to be impartial. But how do we push back against that if we're not encouraging, you know, young people to pursue pol to pursue careers in, um, you know, as public servants, or if we're not helping, you know, staff up with, you know, at all levels up and down the UN with US, um, with nationals from the US and its allies and partners, right? So it, it or have the UN been hollowed out in a way while we haven't been paying sufficient attention? And I think, part of what our report was trying to do was to have, you know, attention turned back, not just in regards to Taiwan, but more broadly within the UN system um, to push back against, you know, not just the PRC, but perhaps even Russia as well um, with, within, you know, all elements of the UN from the top to the bottom at all, um, especially like in the standard setting um, entities or standard setting bodies of the UN. I think that's all very important and something that will require greater focus and attention. Um, so I guess I, I also covered some of the policy recommendations there. Yeah, no, that was great. In fact, I think that's a great note to end on. Um, so I'm going to yeah, bring us to a close here. I do want to thank you, our audience for bearing with us in this kind of strange hybrid environment where we're in a classroom, but we also have a virtual speaker. Um, and I want to thank especially our two speakers, Jifu and Jessica, for joining us today to talk about what's a really important uh, issue uh, Taiwan's place in the interstate system and its ability to uh, kind of provide for its people um, in the same way that uh, the rest of the world sovereign countries provide. Uh, and so uh, thanks again for appearing here. Um, if you haven't checked out Jessica and Bonnie Glazer's report, I recommend it to you highly. Uh, if this issue interests you, it is on the uh, German Marshall Fund website. Um, uh, finally, just to uh, reiterate, uh, I'm Kara Steppelman. I'm the uh, program manager of the project on Taiwan in the Indo-Pacific region. Uh, and you've been listening to a talk about Taiwanese at the UN, the use and abuse of UN Resolution 2758. Thanks all, and we'll see you next time. Thank you.